So hey everyone and welcome to another episode of Fight Chat Friday with TKD Coach Academy. This week is a little bit of uh, infotainment you might say. So we're going to really look in depth at the anatomy of an ITF Taekwondo score. Really look deep at how the, the game or how the, our game is scored and what really gets you big value in terms of your scores. everybody welcome back to fight chat friday so this week as adrian said we're gonna have a little bit of a deep dive into values of scores so yeah. me and adrian were having this discussion before we came on air of for me personally it was viking cup 2009 where the value of a score really hit home because it was the first time that i competed with scoreboards and i think for a lot of people before this it was just like let's fight we'll see what the result is at the end oh for sure but now there's a real game state to our sport and i think that today's episode is going to be based on that we're going to really have a look at the ways that you get from your action to the scorecards and what needs to happen what is perceived by judges talking things of ring position initiating techniques spacing between you and the opponent your posture and how all these different things influence whether you get a score on the cards or not and mm -hmm. also how many scores you do get how many judges there's four judges one in each corner and how many judges are you getting as a return for each technique or each combination so i think it'll be very interesting to look at this and also see from the clips that we have today that the techniques and the shots which score more so in terms of others although for me when i was looking through it i was perceiving okay there's a couple of techniques in mind that i think will be scoring a lot and when you see the scorecards it's not always that way sure exactly and i mean i think that's the whole point of this episode is to show that what you feel in the ring as a competitor has nothing to do with what's happening on the scoreboard so without that ability to be able to check you know that external reference and see what's really happening on the scoreboard your internal clock is probably way off and mm. it's because there's so many factors that go into making a score uh, and uh, and fundamentally because we're scoring in four separate corners so there are four viewpoints of yep. the match that are being scored simultaneously so maybe we we'll just jump in and have a look at just that like you know that anatomy of a split second or that 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 little bit of what happens mm. in the scores and like we'll do this just from the point of view of maybe you know very little about ITF Taekwondo or maybe you've been competing for a while as a color belt and you understand hey look I get three points for a headshot two points for a kick to the body and one point for a punch but you're like us in the earlier days where you went okay that's what happens when I punch somebody mm -hmm. I get a point everybody writes down the number one and I get a point kind of thing uh showing my age there back to written scorecards but uh <laughs> <laughs> but that's what we think Not happens that then. and then it isn't that simple so maybe if we just have a quick look at that this is the how ITF scoring works. No, 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 really, this is how ITF scoring works. So mm -hmm. the, that, the first part that we're gonna start with is that there's shots fired, there's action, and then at the end of the match, there's a result, there's an outcome. But there's plenty that goes on in between that we really mm -hmm. need to kind of stay cognizant of and, and, and make, make sense of. So this kind of breaks down the first part of it. So from when the shot is thrown to the score being given, it's not a direct, you know action reaction kind of thing some other stuff has to happen so from your own perspective you threw the shot did it hit or did it miss and why are we talking about shots that miss well you will see about that in a second so from the mm -hmm. umpire's perspective they're the ones noting the scores first of all if it hit did they see it because an umpire cannot write down your score or note your score unless they actually saw it make contact that's the theory the second mm -hmm. thing is what if you hit but the judge didn't see it so you know obviously they shouldn't be putting it down their card and then we have this false positive thing which is where you threw a shot it didn't hit but there's a score anyway so this thing can happen as well and we have some examples of that to go through the thing that's going on in the judge's mind as well when they see the technique is first of all you know was it a legitimate technique was it something that they're allowed to score and maybe we don't consider that often enough the next thing is well look did it hit a legitimate target area because maybe it hit to the top of the leg maybe it hit they could say it hit to the back to the shoulder to the back of the head was there contact and if there was contact was it too much contact uh, so that's a different uh, kettle of fish as well mm -hmm. and then finally after executing the technique did you have balance did you recover after the technique because if we exit the ring afterwards if we fall to the ground afterwards without recovering balance 
if we then turn and stay facing away from our opponent we're not getting a score for that so right now our feeling is I've got the score what the referee sees can be a bit different and uh, and you see there's three layers to this then as well in yeah. a split second oh yeah and that's only for what that's one shot thrown what about like the, the kind of the messy exchanges where there's a lot going on yeah a series of combinations possibly a split second so like it's not easy for a judge really and sometimes we give judges a little bit of slack but like the, the job isn't very straightforward as you can see there exactly so as we're running through that the next thing that we're thinking about is the fact that this is happening in four corners so i've got my four colors here but we have the warnings and fouls as well as those scores being pushed through the funnel to give you a scorecard mm -hmm. at the end so of course you're building your scores, although not probably exactly as you remember it for every judge. So you're going to have a different opinion of your score compared to all four of the judges. The second thing is the fouls and warnings apply across the board. They're, they're evenly applied because they're automatic. And they apply to each scorecard equally. So the scores aren't applied to each scorecard equally, but the fouls and warnings are. And they all contribute to the score. So Very important. Yeah, so again, without a, score, or without a scoreboard, it's very hard to balance that because you're not trying to do simple math in your head. You're trying to actually keep four mm. buckets. You know, is it more or less? Is it empty full? What way is it? So at the end, the match result is determined by are you winning, drawing, or losing on the four different scorecards? And of course, we know you need to be winning. Uh, you need at least two scorecards in your favor in order to win. And you need to be, of course... 2-1, two 2-1 to one, two one draw, you know, 2-2-0, two two zero, whatever it happens to be. But you need two scorecards in your favour to draw, or sorry, to win. And what that does is it brings into, you know, it's not enough even to just, you know, draw three and win one. That doesn't do it for you. You need enough mm -hmm. of majority across the, the match. And that becomes important as well. I think we'll come back to that chart in a second. We might just look at some of our scores first, but mm. that is a teaser. If anyone wants to go back, pause it, <laughs> have a look at that. There's a bit of thinking in it. And, but what really, what we'll have a look at first, I think, is just the, the, what a score looks like and why it can be difficult sometimes for a score to get, actually get recognition as a score. Mm. And just even as we're queuing that up as well, the, the last yeah. two slides, what came to mind for me was the... The high, high level elite guys, they're able to calculate these things on the fly. And mm. they may they may be a couple of flags down and they know how many flags they have to fight for. And then maybe a warning will flip that rather yeah. than a score. And this is all done again in a split second as the clock is running down, probably with a lot of people shouting and cheering because you're they want to get you to to go and get that win with ten seconds left or whatever. So oh, it's absolutely. really, really a high level skill to be able to process the board super quick, find out what you need to continue the match if you're losing, at least get the draw, what flags are still available, what are not, and maybe it's a warning. Maybe you need to score a quick shot and get the warning as you do it and it, this is a really really high level skill it is and it's a very different skill from what we had in the the 90s and uh, and 80s or, well sorry even the, like all the way up through the 2000s as you said until 2009 or thereabouts when viking cup mm. uh, and some of the polish championships started using the scoreboards and what you what you had before that was the ability to pass the whole fight in your head am i up or am i down and that was a kind of a Maybe a ballparking kind of thing exercise, but you know, David Kerr said that to us last week, didn't he? Yeah, he did, and uh, you know, and Hong said it before, and you know, hmm. it was an element of yeah, you're trying to keep a record in your head, or am I up or down? And then you kind of have to trust in your own internal mathematics as the match goes on. But the skill has changed now, where it's now about can you absorb the information that's on the board, or that your can your coach absorb it and you know transfer it to you quickly enough, and that is an attentional focusing. It's it's a real you know, a real skill and a real challenge. And it's something that actually has to be practiced as well because mm -hmm. you're taking your focus off of exactly what you're doing with your opponent in front of you, if you choose to do it. Give your attention to a scoreboard, pass all of that information in one go, make a processing of that so you know what your action needs to be based on that and then act all the time mm -hmm. keeping your opponent in regard. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's why when you look at top competitors, they'll use moments when the match is paused. They'll use the, you know, the head shows and the breaks they'll use when their opponent has lost balance or traveled out of the ring and they'll look at the board and they'll kind of they remember how it was before they're looking for what's changed 
and ha- has mm-hmm. that impacted the game state so yeah i think that's i think that it. the new visual on the scoreboard actually helps that as well doesn't it with the with kind the, of like the lines far. yeah 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 exactly so you know that you're way off and you like all right i'm not getting that card back in the last 10 seconds or maybe there's one here there's only one point of a difference so maybe i can try get that score back so that visual mm-hmm. and then knowing where you are with the warnings is important as well i think definitely that visual is way easier to read for a competitor in action than mm-hmm. looking at the uh, the, the, all of the sets of numbers so like yeah eight uh, sorry four pairs of numbers is really difficult so maybe just to illustrate some of the points we're making about the scores we'll have a look at a couple and i'm going to just drop them in as we go so the first one i will leave that one for a second maybe i'll just have a, a look at uh at this one we'll certainly come back on that where's my there we go okay so this one illustrates a series of punches and combinations. Now you could look at this very first one and say, okay, what's happened there? Now you can see you, you, uh, Lindsay's picked up uh, a score, one point on all four scorecards. So it's the punch that she's gotten. But until we put it in slow motion and you really look at it, you can see, oh, Lindsay has blocked Louise's leg. She's got the right hand extended onto the head. That is an absolute perfect scoring instance from the judges. How mm-hmm. hard is that to do? I mean, how do all four judges see that? Uh, and this is the uh, different angle on the uh, the same shot. Whereas here, this particular one, uh, it's given as one point by two judges. So even though okay. it looks just as clear, and this one, where it's right in the center of the ring, and it's a, a nice round kind of uh, avoiding shot, we'll, we'll show it again on this side, uh, from Louise, uh, that's given by two judges as well. And you can easily mm-hmm. see where in that one, okay, a judge might say, no, that was the back of the head. You know, uh, but you have two judges giving a score and two not. And what that does for us is straight away, you see the exact same shot, i.e. it's a punch to the head, is getting four points, it's getting two points. And, yeah. you know, and it's all down to the clarity of the shot, really. It's massive. And we're going to touch on a couple of factors that make this happen throughout this episode. But basically, we're looking at things like um, your posture. Are you very mm. tall? Are you slouching? That's a visual thing that makes it easier for referees and judges. And um, the next thing then is, are you the person who initiates? Absolutely. Are you a more of a reactor? And then also we've got, as you mentioned earlier, the ring position, whether you're very much in the center, where it's a clear visual for four referees or whether you're squished in the corner and it, it's harder for some to see. So there's many, many factors that go into that. And of course, then as well, punching visually is a little bit more clearer in closer yeah. range than kicking so and then on, on obviously vice versa then as well at the further out range yeah particularly with that um and it both it matters that you're fully extended so mm-hmm. you know if the arm isn't extending if the leg isn't extending it's harder to see uh you know as yeah. clearly you want to see that well there you know is the you know the long tool extended and the the target being contacted at the end it's it's much easier to see it and just as we jump back onto something, I um, uh, want to have a look at a couple of quick clips with false positives. Um, so in this case, we have competitor in red getting a two-point score on this particular kick where you can see it, it meets the arms. But it's a two-point score from two judges, um, which is a very interesting one. And that does happen. Especially at that angle. Yeah because it's very hard that to eat for that one it would be very hard for any judge honestly to have seen it because mm-hmm. you know uh it, the competitor is blocking the view to the corner judge to our right and the opponent is blocking the corner view to the judge to the left and certainly neither of the judges on the far side can see it so there's an element of expectation of what was going to happen uh yeah. you know can sometimes lend into the score and a really clear example of this one um again this is from germany and Norway gets a three-pointer on three uh, scorecards for this. And as we go into the slow-mo, you can see there, it, it comes within a couple of inches, but there's no, uh, there's no contact made. Okay, yeah. Now, look, this isn't an indictment of judges. This is nothing like that. But it just shows you yeah. when you're actually watching a match, your brain do- it happens fast, and your brain sometimes fills in the missing pieces. So it's like, mm-hmm. it looks like it should hit. And even in that last uh, one where Connor, uh, the, the Irish competitor in that one, he moves with the kick. It's almost like yeah. it's the same effect that's used in movies to convince us that someone got kicked or punched. You know, the camera shows from here, this comes this way and the head moves. 
and if you time it right it looks like the, and, and you add the sound effect you know yeah. of course that's really important but if you have that it looks like the contact happened and our brains are used to being tricked in that way you know we're used mm-hmm. to having that gap filled in so sometimes we get that false positive of the shot didn't land but we got the score and sometimes we have the reverse where the shot does land and of course we're expecting that we got the score and four score cards you know everyone should have seen that turning kick to the body but it doesn't quite work out that way mm-hmm. so yeah and then you got as well people complain that maybe it's very low scoring and we need more like the judges are a bit harsh with some scores but then you see yeah. that as well so it's very hard it's it, it's very hard in the moment and in the, the the heat of the battle as we kind of alluded to earlier when you've got to process so much information as a judge so they definitely have a have a difficult job but of course as a competitor there's certain things that you can do to help your case then as well like you said with the moving of your head yeah. and kind of going with the shot and of course just the, the whole um the kind of the control you have of a contest as well if you're really allowing the person to initiate a lot there's more of a chance that they're going to be able to get a bit of a return for sure and in terms of looking at that do you want to start with the kind of the long clear shots or the initiated you know our shots initiating maybe we'll have a look at some of those just to kind of illustrate yeah. those points Let's um, have a look at the ones that initiate well yeah because sure. you can see here that a lot of the ones that um have somebody gain a momentum on you if they can get the momentum, the clear shots come to them most sure. of the time. Mm. So um, that that's one of the things that you'll see here throughout some of the clips we're going to see, Ow. is that although some people look for some counters and they try to get some shots off, the factors that we mentioned earlier sometimes hamper that from a visual score. So you'll see some of these clips here. Um, uh, that here we go. When, we got it? Yeah. There we go. So when the person initiates, it's very hard then for the person who is the reactor almost to get a return unless it's super, super clear. Yeah. So um, the momentum and the fact that you're initiating, I think, are two very, very important factors. So you see here, blue Sam Del Rock got, got a nice return here on this one. And then we see the flip. So then we see um, Romanian here getting a return in red. So it's the person who initiates really, really well. Sometimes they get a nice return. As we said, it's a visual thing from the referees. It's like, okay, there was a, an attack by them. Yeah. There was no clear counter attack and there was can, there was some contact. So then that has to be processed really quickly. I think this was an interesting one. You see the, the sidekick here from Blue from Netherlands. Yeah. And then I think it's Adelina here in red just pressures her over the line and she gets a return. I don't think she actually scored any massively cl- uh, clear shot except uh, exactly because I that. think that that was outside the ring. But yeah, then exactly it was that, that. that just that big, big shot that came. It's a visual, isn't it? Yeah, I think it was just as simple as it was a punch given on three cards, but the sidekick from that angle was abundantly clear, but nobody saw it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and and it is one of those things that does happen, you know, constantly simply because you have to remember you're working with human beings. The brain is triggered when you see that action, that forward momentum, and you're inclined to reward that. You know, in the same way here, uh, you know, Norway against uh, Antti from Finland, um, you know, and that forward pressure, you know, there may be a punch back, whatever, but you can see the reward is given to Norway in that mm. case. And, and it wasn't very clear, to be honest. No. So it, it does show you as well that being the person who's kind of trying to take control and, and set it up is, is important. This is a very good clip to illustrate this because Julio sets up the attack against Ryan Shelley here and he initiates... And uh, although Ryan gets a nice clear um, technique at the end, he's rewarded on one card, but watch now the scores flip back very quickly. And then Julio is rewarded very quickly for that with two flags. So yeah. it, it's very interesting to see that. And we should take this opportunity as well to give a shout out to the official ITF channel. Some great work there by Oli Leno from Finland and, and his team to be able to give us this content with the live scoring. And it makes such a difference, I mean, for us in the reviews as well. Like, it's nice to be able to see the cards change. And it's, it can be difficult to see the scoreboards in the background. But, the, you know, the, these quick reversals on the cards, it, it does let us see what's happening to some degree in the match. Mm-hmm. So, again, so this one, is, it's a hard one to, to, to call in the moment. You see the difference there when you're looking at a slow time. It's mm-hmm. much easier to read. But in the moment, it's like, okay, what actually happened there? And it all depends on where you're sitting. Absolutely. And, you know, with these exchanges with hands, they can be messy, you know, and yeah. and then it tends to be who stayed taller and, and we'll come to that later uh, or who got there first. So, mm-hmm. you know, there, there's a 
there's an element of it's not just being there throwing the punches it's can you be there first can you throw them straighter can you throw them taller you know can you make it easier for the judges to see who got the better of the exchange uh you know and the thing is as well with the initiations is that the judges have to look down at the some of them will be very clued in and very experienced and they know where their fingers are but some of them will have to give a quick glance down to see which button they need to press on which side yeah and the person who initiates has a little bit of an advantage there because if anything comes afterwards then there's a chance that for that split second as the head goes down they might they might have lost that for just that split second hmm. now the experienced judges will probably wait for the exchange to happen take all the information in and then give scores so that's why sometimes you see scores coming in a little late yeah and that's generally a good sign from an experienced judge that they can kind of watch yeah. the whole thing um but at the same time you know we know just the nature of perception it can be really difficult to get that straight. You're you're still mm. giving to some degree an impression. Uh, it, yeah. uh, but as a competitor, you know it's the messy exchanges that are the most difficult to score accurately. When you get that a single clear shot, you know the more point sparring style that single clear shot. Mm. Uh, it's much easier for the judges to score, and then you have the moment to pass the scoreboard. I know where I am now. What do I do next? where staying in flow lets you do other things. It lets you build momentum. It lets you, you know, take advantage of a you know, broken rhythm. It, it lets you overwhelm your opponent and build your scores. So there's an advantage to both, but you might not get an accurate return on the scoreboard for your work. Yeah, definitely. So uh, we looked at initiating, but let's look at the, the longer, clearer shots uh, and see what that does for us as well. Oh, I seem to have left in an old video. Whoops, I'll fix that one. Um, so while no, it's I'm a good example. It, it, it was right. actually, it was, it was, the jump punch is actually a super clear one. Um, but uh, I'll just make sure I have that video found uh, before we go. Um, mm -hmm. But the... Yeah, so it, basically the uh, premise for this, everybody that's watching, is it's just to get those longer shots that are very visual. So long and clear. So usually these things go hand in hand. Um, so you see here, I think it's Sam again. Nice, long, yeah. clear sidekick over the top. Yeah. And it's just, it's very easy for you to see, oh, yeah, that's clear. You and know, you, have, whereas, you have a movement from the opponent as well. Like you get a reaction. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and then as well, we, we'll see some clips later where um, maybe you score a sidekick, like the one we seen with Julio earlier, where it was a little bit shorter. And mm. then just because the ring position plays into this as well, if you're closer to the edge, then you're taking away a lot of view from some referees. So it's just getting the long, clear shots. And this goes very much hand in hand with initiating as well, I feel, and being tall and long with your techniques. So usually like we want to be in the pocket and get a lot of good techniques in other combat sports. But for us, because of the way the scoring is, it's actually more efficient to try to keep your techniques long and vis visibly very, very clear. Absolutely. But you can see... You know, it, it, when it comes to kicking, it changes things a little bit as well because, you know, being long and clear when it comes to kicking is really a different distance management proposition. Like it's, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, it, it's easier done on the attack in some, in some cases, but you can see a really, really nice defensive sidekick sometimes, you know, is super clear like that going back from Romania. Um, it, mm -hmm. it catches the opponent stretched on the end of it. And then you have the jumping punch here as well, where you've got that really, super fair. yeah, really yeah, super extension. This is one of the sidekicks that I was uh, mentioning earlier. So the short one here from Norway yeah. scores, but it's so short, it's not long and clear that he only gets a return of one judge here, although he was close enough to the center of the ring. Exactly. And, you know, and, and the center of the ring, that, that ring position thing is critical as well. I mean, you, you can certainly also make the argument that, you know, maybe it doesn't, maybe Andy closes it off, yeah, and it stays a bit low. So... Yeah. You know, these are things that, you know, really do play into it. And, you know, you c I'm sure you can still feel the same, you know, when you're the person who's actually thrown the shot. Yeah. In your head, you've added up that score. You've made that score. In real time. Yeah, exactly. In real time. And sometimes as a coach, even you'll see it and you'll go, OK, well, that's why isn't that on the scoreboard? You know, or, or you yeah. only got one out of that. So sometimes I find myself as a coach needing to communicate with the athlete in the ring. OK, you just got one. You know, you, you only got one card for that. Or, you know, even if they, you know, it goes the other way around, the opponent throws something and it's like, oh, okay, they only got that in one card, you still have three or, you know, whatever. Just sometimes you need that information to enable you to, uh, you know, to, to, to really act appropriately because you, yeah. can get, you can feel as well. Like, you know, if you, if you try for a blitz and you get caught in the defensive psychic, you feel like, oh, well, everybody saw that. That's a, you know, whereas yeah. it might only have turned up on two cards. 
And that kind of reminds me as well of before um, in the ITF, before the Euros and Worlds, they used to rotate the ring councils like they do now. Yeah. Sometimes you might have the same ring council on a ring for the week. And there'll be discussions in, when you're watching in the crowd, you're like, oh, they're, they're scoring psychics heavy in that ring. Yeah. Versus yeah. a ring over here, ring seven, the opposite side, they're, they're, they're a big fan of, of the hands over there. And that would be a discussion that you'd hear in the crowd, you know, usually the juniors would be on before the seniors and that yeah. discussion would take place. And so it, it's an interesting like. one as well. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So maybe that's a good chance to chat about this chart that we were popping up before. And I'll leave it up there so people can kind of dig into it. But it's just, it's the next little level in terms of what the, the scores actually are. So the bit on the left, everybody knows, which is a head kick is three points, a body kick is two points, and the punch is one point, whether it's head or body. And then a foul is minus one, straight up, you lose a point. Uh, and the, the, every third warning, so for every three warnings, you lose a point as well. But then it gets... And every card. Tricky. Yeah, this is the thing. This is where it gets tricky. So if we start with a head kick, head kicks will almost never be seen by less than two people. But sometimes yeah. they're seen by all four, even as, as bizarre as that sounds. Sometimes they're seen by all four. So the, it gives you kind of a, a range where, you know, on the low end, you'll get six points distributed over a couple of cards. On the high end, you might even be getting 12 points distributed over the four cards. But, you know, averaging out there that nine, that three flags kind of thing. Whereas you look at a body kick and it could be seen by none. And we saw that from quite a few of our examples. And I want to see the examples first before we put up the chart. So that this maybe sits in context. You could see plenty mm. of times where a body kick is thrown and just the judges don't catch it because it's heading to the corner. You know, and we'll explain this a bit more in a while, but there are many reasons. Uh, it just might not be clear. But we also had one or two examples where three judges could give a, a score. But a body kick should yeah. never get those four judges. It just shouldn't. So as well Based as starting, the angles of it, yeah. as well as starting off that lower uh, score of two points, it's less visible, and so typically you're kind of seen by well, maybe two judges will see it, but you're kind of averaging it out between one and two and scoring maybe three points split over you know the scorecard. So how can you do that? Well, look, sometimes you'll get two on one, sometimes you'll get two on two. Uh, and it averages out there at about three. So sometimes what we're trying to get with these averages is, hey, if you're a competitor and you don't have the benefit of a scoreboard, what you want to do is, if you're keeping that tally in your head, almost imagine that, you know, that's what I'm getting. That's the return I'm getting. It's more like the average. Mm. Um, for the head punches, you can see with some of our examples, it can be super clear. It's almost never seen by less than two, and it's usually seen by three or four. So you're likely to get three scores or three points distributed over three cards, you know, from that, from a punch to the head, as long as it meets those criteria. It's long, it's clear, it's easy to see. Whereas the body punch, well, it can be tricky. You know, it, it, yeah. it, it needs to be a Zach Espy to the gut and the person drops <laughs> or it needs something there. So typically, again, one to two scores off of that. But where this gets super interesting for me as well, and this was a big discovery for us when we actually went back and do, did a lot of match analysis after... Uh, 2011 uh, you know between New Zealand in 2011 uh, at the World Championships and in the Euros in Slovakia I think it was 2011 um, we had some very disappointing places we had a lot of quarterfinals we had a lot of semi-finals um, the juniors did really really well in Slovakia top junior country in Europe but when we went and looked at why we weren't getting through the rounds, one of the big things we found is that a lot of our competitors who were really good quality people were conceding far too many warnings. And we came up with a basic formula after that for Ireland, which was we don't expect to win if we concede more than five warnings. It's very, very yeah. simple. We started to train you know, with that in mind. And the thing is, you have a cliff edge. So the two warnings don't matter at all. There's no impact on the score whatsoever. Mm -hmm. The third one is a big deal. We, but we just expect, look, the match happens we're going to lose three the the trick is can you control it's over two rounds you don't lose more than five and that's what it comes down to because again like you said it's applied in all the scorecards so that minus point for the third warning is actually four minus points it's more impactful than a nice straight clear jumping punch to the head you know it's yeah. it's more impactful than that and then the foul well the third one is a, a, a cliff edge but you know if e even a single foul just changes the game completely. You know, it flips mm -hmm. everything because it's an immediate four-point deduction spread across the cards, and it's huge. So 
I think what we're trying to get across with this chart is we think of it as a 3-2-1 point game. Actually, warnings and fouls matter just as much to the scoring of the match as the kicks and punches. And the mm -hmm. kicks and punches matter in quite a different way than the 3-2-1 would lead you to believe. So I think that's kind of the, the initial uh, kind of impression that we need to keep in mind on that one. Um, and then finally... We did this little psychedelic heat map. Um, mm -hmm. And what this really kind of talks about is the fact that they're, the different areas in the ring, get re, they, they yield a different return on the effort that you put in to get a score. So if you're in those cold areas, those blues in the corners, and you're scoring but tight in the corner on the way out, the chances of you getting a return are very little, very, very low. And you might only get it off of one judge. Whereas as you move through the green into the orange, into the warm orange, into the red, the chances are that more judges will see your shots. So keeping that in mind, there are some areas of the ring that, and certainly the central portion, if you can build your big scores there, and of course you don't always get a choice, but if you can build your big scores there, you can expect a higher reward. Whereas if you're putting someone into a corner and you're taking a shot on the way out of the ring, you're not likely to impact the scorecards dramatically. So that's, you know, it's something to really consider, particularly for people who are patient, uh, who, who wait for the opportunity, who pull people into them. Uh, you, you just might have to build up in very marginal increments. So it doesn't mm. matter as long as you're not being scored on. Uh, if you're only getting one scorecard or two scorecards, you know, for every score that you get, it doesn't really matter too much. But the second the, the match is a bit more free-flowing or it opens up a little bit, warnings become more of an issue. Yeah. It becomes a big thing. And you, you see that, Adrian, don't you? You see people who are looking to counter and they're like their mindset is don't concede any shots. Yeah. And then you might see within the first 30 seconds, they're already on two warnings because they chose to step out instead of conceding a shot. Yeah. But now the next one, which is more than likely going to be inevitable, that's going to actually get a, a very clear shot technically on yeah. all cards. So like we kind of seen there in the low scoring chart that we just had up, that a body kick, although worth two points compared to one for a punch, you might only get it on two cards. So it's still going to be 2-2, two, two, even mm. if you score a body kick after that, even though it's worth more value. So the, the value of the scores in terms of the one, two, three is not the same as the return that you're looking at. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And what that does mean for us is that when you're chasing a score, when you're looking to, uh, to cement a lead, the kind of shots that you go for you know, you, you, you need to kind of keep the value and the return on those in mind as you go for those mm. shots. Um, whereas uh, it, it's also very, very relevant in a uh, golden point. So when yeah. you're looking at that, you're looking to get your, your cards. That's not so bad because two, two, uh, you know, two flags will do you now. You know, when you needed the three flags, it was pretty much, you know, you needed to get a punch or a kick to the head, you know, to guarantee those three cards or a super clear Kill punch kick. Yeah, exactly. But it's still Go quite relevant, yeah, that the more you back yourself into the corner, the less likely it is. And a body kick is maybe the hardest thing to see, you know, in a lot mm -hmm. of ways. So it's just something to keep in mind for people as they get to that uh, position. Mm. Speaking of um, th that ring position, will we have a look at Auntie's example? Yeah, really good. Uh, so let me just find that one and have a look here. So a few examples here of the difference between being on the edge and being in the center of the ring. And this one, even you were a great example of not being able to see it at all. We can't see what happened there at yeah. all from this angle. Like, I wouldn't be scoring this one. And then, whoa, two flags. And then we see the reverse of it. Oh, you actually don't, I, I, I don't think I found the one. Uh, no, no, no. I don't think I found the reverse uh, okay. of that one. But there is a but punch that the does land the body in it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So this didn't score. I think it might have scored one max. Um, I don't but think you see it did. the contact of it. So there you go. It's just such a different perspective when you're looking at a different view. And when we talk about ring position, we're not only talking about where you are in the ring, but the, the view of the referee. So we're taking that from two points. Mm. So here you go. One point from Anti. And now look at this one. Exact same shot, but he's in the center of the ring. And now he gets a return on yeah. all four. Exactly. It was so huge difference. one judge versus all four judges just by the exact same shot roughly the same distance between them as well but just by being in the center of the ring oh absolutely yeah and again you can see here with the you know that you know there there is a shot in there that's clear but it's that 
combination, the ring position, and the initiative. You know that he he uh, yeah. he's gone first. He's taken the initiative, and he's gone first. You know, which is quite quite huge. And you know, I I just think like you know when we watch this from this side, you just say you know the girl bounced to the other side, nothing much happened, but she has managed to sneak that right hand punch in somehow. And you yeah. know, two judges have seen it, which is you know quite unusual. And this looks like a score from you know both angles. Uh, mm-hmm. but we're not getting that return even in the slow motion you know and you could say her opponent will be a little bit unhappy she didn't get a, any return on that as uh, Adelina turned into it but you know it does it has to be clear it has to be visible you know that, and it just it does just complicate things a little bit right this one is super clear from the angle we're looking at the yeah. camera and I'm assuming that's the judge that scored it we and this is so. the sim- similar angle here but all judges see it like technically from the angle we're looking at on the camera we can't see the contact but yeah. it's very clear for for um, most of the people there but he got the four flags regardless so yeah and i mean i think that's that that's still that point of joining the dots like if the flow of events leads to an inevitable conclusion the brain can join the dots sometimes so we want to make sure yeah. it you know it we, we follow through now you can't completely influence that all the time but you know you sent me a clip and it was an unusual one i, I had a good laugh at it actually um where you know, we, we, we'd often see very inexperienced people kind of finding themselves stuck sideways and ending up kind of jabbing repeatedly off the front hand. Yeah, yeah. But you found an example where that was, you know, getting three <laughs> three clear, uh, clear points back in it. And even when we jumped back a generation, we were watching Julia Cross and, uh, and Neil Ernest to some degree. You know, mm. they do a great job of getting, you know, getting the hands uh, being on the outside of the their opponent's shoulder and punching across the body with the front hand. And, you know, it's just the way that they arrived to that position, but you know it, it can become super clear. So although it's not the most stylish looking shot, and it's not something we'd necessarily be coaching people to try, you know, a triple jab or something. Yeah, there are examples to be found where people are getting two and three scores on all cards off of something like that. So it's it's quite incredible that you know you yeah, will sometimes get that find glove on the helmet. Yeah, it in just any works. way necessary. Exactly, it well, just like- works. Usually, like we've done lot, lots of posts on this before, and I've uh, written like a, a blog post on this as well. Of if you're a puncher, beware, because it only takes one good clear headshot. And like we've seen, usually the headshots get a nice return yeah. because they're quite visible. So if somebody, if you're scoring with your hands a lot and you get a couple of exchanges off, you may be nice and comfortable on the cards, and then one headshot can flip it all around again because mm. it's so clear. So it's just like, although the scores for hands are usually ones that get a nice return, it's like you, you can't just settle and be a puncher only. You have to, you can't be outworked if you're if you're the puncher. You have to really work hard to make sure that you're getting a nice return and really build up past that tree because uh, it, it can be dangerous as well if you if you get that headshot. Oh, definitely. Um, so just looking at, uh, you know, a couple of other... Um, how would you say point so this is just looking at a, a bit of a messy exchange um, and, and then the result that's given and I mean if we look at that again like you know it's very hard to see where you know the, the mm-hmm. uh, where the shot arrived from and you, you think build... Rom- Romanian red maybe just extends the hand kind of like we were just chatting about there but yeah. as we said, it's very hard to see from our angle. So I'm assuming it has to be the guy in the far corner, the judge that we can actually see here. Yeah. I think that he maybe uh, have a, has a visual on that. But from our perspective on this angle where the camera is, it, it's it's hard to see anything, isn't it? Yeah. And then we we have this one, which is uh, an interesting one when you look at it as well. It kind of shows that. So there's a there's a lovely from like my perspective anyway. There's a a, a lovely clear side kick to the body. Mm-hmm. Um which does this one does yield you know uh that that two point score because it's long because it's in the center um but there's uh uh the, the exact same uh shot you know or sorry a different shot we have a kick to the body kick to the body and only one of them is scored and then we have two judges who see this kick to the head and when you look at it in the slow motion like there's a lot to a lot that could have been given so, you know, you have a hook kick to the body, um, you have a, a straight side kick to the body, and then, you know, as you come back around here, we have this flick to the face, which you'd think, okay, yeah, that should be seen pretty clearly. 
and when it when it comes to what actually turns up on the scoreboard we end up seeing okay the two body kicks are getting you uh uh one on one card each so it, it it's two different judges saw them you know one gave one one gave another and then when it came to the headshot okay that's two judges again um and you know t- two judges a fairly low return in a headshot sometimes you know but but yeah. you're looking at that and you're going Oof, okay but it, it it just serves to to show that there's a few things missing you know in terms of those shots like the, and the reason that they're not the ooh shots that are really really clear so you know the side kick for me was probably the one that was the the most clear of the shots because it did kind of catch the person and stretch them out the hook kick that comes up along the body comes near a glove so there's always a question of did it hit the glove did it not and it's not a shot that's super super obvious because it, there's no impact when it lands it doesn't do anything and the shot that comes up to the head there's no head movement you know there's no slap there's no you know head movement with it there's nothing to kind of complete the picture for us so yeah although there's absolutely nothing wrong with it and it's a scoring shot sometimes it just doesn't create the impression that leads to the score and i think you know that's quite unfortunate so mm-hmm. um i think we had one other thing we were looking at was just the, the posture i think in terms of the um you know in terms of positioning yourself to be able to get good scores and maybe it's worth having a quick chat through that one yeah posture is important and you can see actually that this clip here of bartos the posture he has just allows him to get a more visual yeah in yeah, the, yeah. In the, yeah, in the on, background on Hong Louis there so yeah but the, if when we talk about posture what we're talking about here is is basically not slouching so if you if you slouch with the technique and, and kind of crunch up your body the techniques are shorter and then it kind of it links in with the whole idea of long and clear that we spoke of earlier it's the opposite of that isn't it so you yeah. want to keep your techniques long so this one here Julio actually gets a nice side kick off but because Ryan has a nice tall posture and he's very direct and clear he gets the return on the scoreboard. So you see the score will flip here. Yeah. So Ryan actually got the score for that front hand, although Julio scored um, arguably a nice sidekick there as well. So it, the, the posture and, and the, visi- the, the visibility of it all based on the, the clarity of the technique is so important. And if you go back to the video, we, we looked at Zach Espy and, you know, in a video looking at punching. And, you know, without being the tallest guy in the ring sometimes, he would just get so tall when he was punching and get the arms, you know, so fully extended it was just really obvious scoring. And I think that's mm. a huge deal, um, you know, when it comes to this, that if you can be the one on top with the legs, if you can be the initiator, if you have the taller posture, if you're getting that full extension, if it's in the right area of the ring, we're starting to build a picture of, you know, what would what's you a ideally score see? versus what's a generic score that maybe not yeah. going to get you the, the win on all cards, maybe. So, yeah, yeah it, re- it really does show that, like, the, the sc- a score is not a score. It's like that uh, the argument the calorie is not a calorie and, and the, yeah. the back and forth there that, that's on that. But it's it, it just shows you that it, their scores are very different. But you see, what it lends to as well is what style of fighter is going to get a better return on their investment. So if you have someone who, you know, picks out lovely body turning kicks and back kicks and, you know, uh, and counter fights very, very well, they may leave the other person, you know, walking out of there with bruised ribs, but they may not get a return on the, and, you know, two or three jabs might actually win that match, you know, and, yeah. and it's quite unfortunate. And then you see some of the guys, like particularly over the last few years, we've had some very tall juniors at like say 56, 63, 70, where they have a really dynamic front leg. Mm. So the match might be going badly for them. They're, you know, they're, they're conceding six and eight warnings, but they can still float that leg over the top of the blindside shoulder. And there we go, there's three points, you know, yeah. super clear. It comes from the heavens, it drops down onto your head, the head moves, the body drops, the whole nine yards four judges score it and you're like okay i guess you're just going to win this one then as well so mm. you know you do have that it, happening it does dictate the style absolutely and i think that the scoreboards uh, when they came in mm. i think that completely changed the, the style of fighting that we have now in itf because like anybody who's seen our um recent videos looking at david Kerr, we did one of going through the different styles through the generations we see like the the polish style of Daniel Diaula and people like this moving around, picking off very nice scores. Then when you look at the the kind of system that we have here with the visual scoreboards, people tend to kind of pull away from that a little bit more. They look to the more direct point fighting style of trying to maybe yeah. get a bit of momentum on their side. And you can see why based on the clips that we've seen today, you get the return on that. And it's, it's, the, it's the rule set and the scoring that dictates the styles that are efficient. 
so they're the, the styles that are going to come to the forefront well exactly that so let's have a look at the negative scoring so this is where you lose all your points and you know again it was a huge learning for us just how impactful this is like once the scoreboards came up you started to have this phenomenon of losing in the last 10 seconds on a third warning you know and this was never a thing before you know you never lost because of a mm. warning and once the scoreboards came out, you realized, oh, you did. So we have, okay, it's a one-point lead on, a, on the four scorecards, but the third warning comes up, and all of a sudden, we have an even match. You yeah. Know? And when you think of, okay, 4 and I'm, I'm comfortable here, but then just a quick switch. And here's another example of Antti. He has the 4 nil, Nice little exchange there in the corner. And then you see the warning comes. And it flips everything right back. So at least, at least um, he, he was very... Even here with the 1-1. One, one. Got a nice exchange. Very clear punch here for a lot of judges. Coach goes wild. Yeah, judges absolutely. Click. But then we see the value of a warning come into play here. So obviously, um, Antti was on his second warning or potentially his fifth. I'm, I imagine it was the yeah. second. I think this was the first round. So uh, this flipped it over again. So it just shows you the, the importance of that. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, the, the thing is, the warnings, they can kick in at any time, you know. I mean, it, it can be that it's the fifth, it can be that it's the eighth, it could be the, you know, but the, you know, in this case, it's a minus point where he goes from like three foul, one yeah. up to, yeah, it's, it's a it's a big deal. And, and within a, a couple, one flip, exchange, yeah. yeah, you've gone from four nil up to two one down, you know, on the basis really of just that one foul. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's, a, it's a very, very tough one when you when you see it sometimes to go, well, what was that about? And... You know, I have no idea what that foul was for, but the, um, the, you know, it, it's hugely, hugely, hugely impactful on the match. And you know, Ryan hasn't landed a punch here. <laughs> you know, yeah, it, yeah. It's you're you're looking at you're going mm, okay, but it's all of the things that we've talked about before. You, you know, you, you've gone in there, you've been told, you've got that long posture, you've made it look like you know, effectively what is coming is it's looked like the punch should land. Um, mm. But the impactful thing, the one thing that no, no one could do anything about was the uh, was the minus point, and and that's the thing. The minus point, you know, sometimes is just something that it comes to the referee's decision, and there's nothing you can do about it. You've got to make a better decision there, uh, and get up and go. And like just on that uh, that last one, actually, the uh, we have an exchange of hands, and it's uh two two so uh italy is two uh, uh yeah so italy in red was uh two flags and two draws and uh nothing scored for the hands but once the uh, the warning came in that's four flags up and mm -hmm. you know you can see that kind of thing the whole time yeah and the, the, we kind of alluded to it earlier we mentioned that uh, the people who are really experienced are able to recognize okay i can potentially get a warning here and a score mm -hmm. and then it's a, as good as a, as a two-point shot that you're looking for a kick so a kick is obviously harder to score yeah. but if you can put pressure chances are you're going to get them on the back foot you might get them to fall over you might get them to leave the ring and yeah. you've probably gotten a nice score on return from your hand technique your punch so you might get at one point there and then it might also have an extra bonus and one as they say in uh, basketball exactly so uh, you, you kind of get that extra bonus point in a way and here's the thing and i mean the, if, if you talk about how it's shaped our thinking in ireland over the last number of years once we kind of decided that look we can't afford to concede more than five warnings because it puts us in a very bad place you're starting effectively you know two points down no one can start two points down that's ridiculous we found no one really, very, very rarely does anyone finish under three warnings. So that, that was the thing of just as matches progress, warnings happen. Usually both competitors will get three warnings. Yeah. So we're not attacking that. We're not trying to get to, you know, uh, to, to zero. But what you get into a position is very quickly, it's like, well, how do we control it? Because there's no point in saying, let's just not get warnings. You have to take decisions to control it. So it means you have to choose to fight more towards the center of the ring. You have to choose... Uh, not to pick shots that are likely to put you off balance so mm. spins become less common angled shots like you know dodging turning kicks and things like that become less common a back kick becomes uh, yeah we might throw it but we're going to really consider it you don't throw uh, uh, exit shots so in other words you don't wait and take a shot towards the edge of the ring 
uh, you're making a decision a mat earlier. You're looking at going to hands more often because a hand, the hands will bring you into contact and close the space. So the whole game plan for the majority of competitors had to shift a little bit to accommodate the fact that we were going to get less warnings. And so that changed the whole game. The fouls, mm -hmm. well, the fouls we had to adapt to as well because if you go back and we looked at clips from, say, Viking Cups and European Cups, World Cups, Irish fighters were getting into the mix of it a lot more. You know, there was a there was a lot more, uh, a lot more contact, a lot more contact, a lot more hands thrown, a lot more bloody noses, and all the rest of it. But once you realise that you're conceding a foul, and that you really don't know who's going to get the foul when it comes to contact, yeah, yeah. It, it gets very hard to know who's going to get that foul. You then have to go, well, what do the referees not want to see? Well, we don't want to see clinches or holding, so we have to be careful about that, and we have to have a strategy around that. You don't want to have, um, you know, uh, stand-up punching contests. So you either get your momentum or you concede the, sp the space, but you don't meet in the middle and, and bang. And, mm. you know, and so basically you end up kind of, awesome. yeah, the game is pushed towards something where, okay, we're either initiating, we're getting that first score and we're exiting, or we're, you know, we're retreating, trying to take the count or slip or avoid, and we're looking to put a shot where we can control the power of it. And, you know, that's just adapting to what we were seeing on the scoreboards. It's like we were mm -hmm. winning that one, then there was that foul, then we lost. We were winning that one, then we realized there was nine warnings. So, you know, we lost. So you could It's not just about the techniques. No. So we quickly realized it's not about winning the fight. It's not about just the techniques. It's about we have to play this game and we have to work with the scoring system that's there. The scoring system shapes the game because you win by you win on the scoreboard. You don't win in the ring. You know, that's yep. the or, or vice versa. If what you do in the ring hits the scoreboard, but you know, in the end, it's the scoreboard at the end that they look at to decide who the winner was, not who had the best yeah. shots, who who bossed. You might the win ring. the fight, but uh, you might lose the contest. Yeah, yeah you who win, wants to you win wants the fight to be in that situation? That's it. Yeah, so, yeah. Again, looking at our little psychedelic diagram, it meant spending a little bit more time in the uh, the reds and oranges, and a little less time in the blues and greens, and looking for mm. our scores in particular, you know, in those areas, and avoiding making decisions in the blues and greens, making decisions in the orange and red, you know, uh, and so kind of giving ourselves a, a better chance at a positive outcome. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's, it's one of the, the big highlights for me here as I was looking through those clips, it was the one with Ryan and Julio, just that we've seen is it's like there was a massive flip and there's yeah. a quick glance at a board by both competitors, two very, very experienced guys. Yeah. But the decision making skills and the adapt adapting that you need to do on the fly there is is the difference really for me between winning and losing. Mm -hmm. And Julio, for example, very, very clever guy in the ring, very, very experienced. He knew where he was now, and there was a big flip, and he went after that directly straight oh, yeah. away. The psyche there's, came there's up no right off the blocks. Yeah, it did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that, that for me, it's a massive skill. We we talked to our uh, ten most important skills in a video previously, but that was up there for both of us. The the ability to adapt on the fly based based on the game state. Yeah, and yeah. what's working, what's not, what's not working, what's getting a return on the scoreboard, what's not getting a return, mm -hmm. and then when you see that what you need to do based on the time that's left then let's go with it. We need to make these decisions quickly. We can't afford to kind of just do what we've been doing all along. You have to adjust and adapt based on the scoreboard. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, for me, the message out to people is this. It's like, look at how you spar. Look at the shots that you like uh, and look at what we've been saying and see, look, are those shots, is that style, is that strategy getting you an efficient return in the ring? Because in the end, we, we can choose to spar any way we want. You know, and we can mm. accept that our, spar, our sparring style is less efficient, is less productive, doesn't generate the scores. Or we can decide to shape our sparring style and the shots that we have and the way that we play to suit the scoring system that we have. And there's still plenty of variance within that. So I can fight high tempo, lower tempo, higher scoring, lower scoring. I can be denial style. I can, you know, there's a lot that I can do. But I have to recognize the basic facts that a score is not a score is not a score. They're, they're yeah. not the same. And that we have a two-way scoring system in ITF Taekwondo. We have scores that go up and scores that go down. And that mm. the scores that go down are far more reliable in terms of how they're applied yeah. than the scores that go up. So you need to control both sides of that equation if you're going to win. Mm -hmm. 
Definitely. Like it comes back to some of the things we spoke about previously, the control of ring position, control of tempo, control mm-hmm. of distance. And you can see that all of these play into all the scores and all the analysis that we've checked out today. So it's being able to control these things in the way you want is going to probably lead you towards a better return as well. Yeah. And what I'd say after today's episode is definitely, look, if people have comments, if you want to talk about the scoring system, if you have ideas for what works or what doesn't, if any of this was new to you, please leave some of that in the comments so that we can, you know, uh, work off of that and uh, build Mm -hmm. a little bit more content around this if it's needed. Uh, But definitely, I hope that was uh, informative for you at least. And for for some people, I'm 100% sure because it was for us uh it had a huge impact on how we viewed the game how we shaped the game and uh what we uh then had to look to do as competitors and coaches in order to be effective in the game absolutely so as always guys hope you enjoyed the video like share it with your friends on social media make sure you subscribe if you're new and we'll catch you in the next one thanks for watching everybody see you folks